U.S. convoys were parked all around the streets in Southampton waiting for the off. One was composed of black men. They didn't mix races. My 14-year-old sister and I were besotted with one of them. He was charming, but after a couple of days they moved on. Troops didn't stay long in one place. I don't know why. They were replaced by a convoy of white soldiers who included a man called Julius Cooke, a German who had become a naturalised American and hated what the Germans were doing. He was a short squat man, no oil painting, but my could he sing. Today, whenever I hear Rose Marie, my mind goes back to D-Day. We were living in a rented house in Derby Road, Southampton in those days, a very neighbourly area with a village-like atmosphere. I was 15 years old and one of five sisters who had moved back to Southampton from Bournemouth with our mother after being evacuated in 1939. My mother took pity on the men who were desperately tired and had been forced to sleep in their lorries. She invited several into our home where they crashed out on beds and chairs. My mother didn't have much to offer because of rationing, but she made gallons of tea and cut up piles of bread for cucumber sandwiches, which they thought so English. In return, they gave us some of their rations. They made our eyes pop out, tins of meat, fruit, sweets and chocolate. When the convoy moved off, we said farewell with promises to write. My mother was upset, knowing where they were heading. Julius returned early the following morning to say thank you again with another parcel of goodies. My mother kept her promise and wrote to him and his fiancée in America for quite a while, but we lost touch when we moved around after my father was demobbed. As our nurse's home had been bombed, we had been billeted out in a large house in Highfield, Southampton. For weeks before, we had become used to the activity around the house, the movement of troops and the droning of aircraft, which had disturbed our sleep. On June the 6th, someone dashed into our room and gave us the shock news. A reliable source on the wireless had broadcast that we had made landings on the Normandy coast. We hurriedly dressed and in small groups made our way to catch our tram. The activity was far greater that morning and services were irregular and packed. Breakfast roll call at the hospital was at 7.30am. We could not be late and we decided to walk, or as it happened, run. But to no avail, we were late and home sister demanded to know why. She would have none of our excuses and promptly sent us on duty, as if we nurses should have known the biggest secrets of the war. Some wards had to be cleared at once in readiness for wounded troops. What a magnificent job they made of the evacuation. Some patients were sent home, others went to different hospitals, even to Broadlands, Lord Mountbatten's home. By midday, everything was ready and the small teams of medical specialists who had been appointed were standing by. Later that afternoon, I saw the first soldiers arriving. They were in stained battle dress covered with grey army blankets with huge yellow labels attached to them, stating that the new wonder drug penicillin had been given. I believe it was the first time it had been administered in the hospital. Priority was always given to the armed services. They were examined and each team of the specialists made their own priorities. Army interpreters helped the medical staff too, as French, Belgian and German soldiers came in. The powers were put under a different category. I remember a young nursing colleague who had just got married telling me she was sure her husband was in this lot. He had taken part in the landings and she was so afraid, but he returned unscathed.